Good morning. I am Shannon Bay, the Program Manager of Adult and Community Engagement at the George O'Keefe Museum. Before we get started with our program, if you have not done so, please introduce yourself in the chat. To find the chat, go to the bottom of your screen as seen here and click on chat. If you're using iPad, the chat can be found at the top of your screen. Also, you have the option within the chat to just send a message to the panelist or to send it to panelists and all attendees. So that is right above where you would um, write your message. So you can choose to send it to either of those audiences. The chat box will appear once you click on it and um, please utilize it throughout the talk for questions, which Tori will answer at the end. You can close the chat box by clicking on the X in the upper right corner. If the chat box is in the middle of the screen, you can move it around your screen by clicking on it and holding down your mouse button and dragging it. We also have closed captioning available. So on your screen, it should be near the bottom or potentially at the top of your screen, you'll see a CC and you can click on that and then closed captioning will come up for you. I would like to begin by recognizing the lands of the Pueblo people on which the sites of the George O'Keefe Museum stand. We recognize and honor their elders, past and present, and celebrate the vitality of their people today and into future generations. I offer this with humility and gratitude, in acknowledgement of the need to confront the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. I would like to extend a thank you to our members and donors who are here today. Your support made this event possible. And if you're not yet a member and enjoy this program, please consider joining today as your gift will be matched dollar for dollar with our matching gift program. Visit gokm.org slash membership to learn more. I would also like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities and the New Mexico Humanities Council, who have supported this lecture in part by a generous grant. Now to introduce our speaker for today. Our presenter this morning is Tori Dugan, the Research Collections and Services Associate for the George O'Keefe Museum. Tori has a Bachelor's of Art, Arts degree in Art History and Women's Study from Humboldt State University and is currently enrolled in the Master of Library and Information Science program at the University of Washington. Tori has worked for the museum for seven years with a primary focus of her work being on cataloging and providing access to George O'Keefe's personal libraries. Without further ado, our presenter, Tori Dugan. Thank you, Shannon, for that introduction. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, as Shannon said, my name is Tori Dugan, and I'm the Research Collections and Services Associate. I've been watching the chat, and I'm really delighted to see some familiar names and some new guests as well. I'm excited to be here with all of you this morning as we take a look into George O'Keefe's personal libraries. Before we dive in, I wanna just give a little brief overview about the work that I do and how I work with the library collections. So I work in the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, Michael S. Engel Family Foundation Library and Archive, which we usually just call the Library and Archive or the Library. It's housed in the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum Research Center, which you can see here. It's about a block away from the museum galleries in Santa Fe. The library is staffed by myself and the head of research collections and services, Elizabeth Ernst. We work to serve internal patrons. So that means staff, docents, interns, and volunteers, as well as public patrons. We do this by collecting, providing access to, and preserving information about the life and work of Georgia O'Keeffe. We're here to support research, provide reference assistance, help using research tools, and probably the most behind the scenes work that we do, but one of our core activities is cataloging the library and archive collections. This morning, I'm really only going, going to be talking about the library collections. Um, the library collections are made up of published materials like books, whereas the archive collections consist of things like photographs and letters. So cataloging the library collections is one of my core duties, and uh, that includes cataloging the books in O'Keeffe's personal library. What is cataloging and why do we do it? 
we catalog to record, preserve, and make material available for research. Cataloging is the process of recording data to represent a resource. Standard data that I would record for a book in our general collections is information like title, author, publisher, and date. The recorded data for one resource is called the catalog record. And you can see that catalog record here uh, for the publication Faust. Catalog records are then kept in the library catalog, which serves as an inventory of the library's collections, and it's organized in a way to facilitate discovery and retrieval of items. Our library catalog, which you can see at the homepage of it here, is available online at library.okeefemuseum.org. So anyone can go and search the library collections from our library catalog. From there, you can search our general collections, see reading lists that we've pulled together, and of course, that's where you can search through O'Keeffe's personal libraries. In our library catalog, you can discover all kinds of unique information about O'Keeffe's books. Cataloging O'Keeffe's books is a particularly special task. When we're, when we're cataloging these items, we still record the standard data like title and author, but we also want to record the information that's specific to O'Keeffe and to that book. So to do this, we inspect the books page by page to look for anything unique, like an inscription or something found in the book, like a letter or a photograph. Then we record this unique information in the catalog record. So the uniqueness about that item can be discovered by anyone. The numbers that are listed here next to these key terms um, indicate how many titles from O'Keeffe's libraries are currently associated with that key term. So for example, as of right now, there are 293 titles from O'Keeffe's libraries that have inscriptions, or there are 818 titles in O'Keeffe's libraries that had some kind of enclosure found within them. So this gives you an idea, kind of the extent of things that you can find and discover in O'Keeffe's books. Because of this, O'Keeffe's libraries offer a profound avenue of endless research possibilities. When we discover an enclosure, such as a card or a letter, uh, we remove that item and replace it with an archival page marker. That way the physical location of the item is marked, but the book and the item are better preserved separately. Then when we remove the item from the book, those pieces go into the archive. And the reason for that is because keeping like material together allows for better management, preservation, discovery, and ultimately access of that item. And there's some different recording and cataloging standards for library material and archival material. There are two primary archival collections that are connected to O'Keeffe's personal libraries. The first one is called the Papers from the Ghost Ranch Library. Uh, this collection consists of material that was found in the books from O'Keeffe's Ghost Ranch House. This collection is completely processed and it can be viewed online in the museum's collections online. The second archival collection is called the Georgia O'Keeffe Papers. And this collection consists of material that is being removed from the books from O'Keeffe's Abiquiu House. And this collection is currently being processed. And I just wanna take a quick moment to say that October is Archives Month. And today actually is Ask an Archivist Day. Uh, so October 7th, 2020. If you're, on, if you're on Twitter, check out the Ask an Archivist hashtag and see what the archivists are up to. We can learn about O'Keeffe's books through the actual items themselves, and we will, we'll talk about that. But there's also a number of ways that we can learn more about the books and about what she thought about them. As many of you know, O'Keeffe was a prolific letter writer, and so she often wrote about the things that she was reading. And reading O'Keeffe's letters is a great way to delve into her thoughts on a particular book. So, for example, this letter here was written by uh, George O'Keeffe to her sister Claudia in 1951, and she's writing about the book All Men Are Brothers. And I'll read the little the quote from the letter. It says, 
I am reading a book that Hilda might like, All Men Are Brothers, translated from the Chinese by Pearl Buck. It just goes on from one adventure to another, and I find it very amusing. It is considered one of the four great works of China. So the copy of the book is in O'Keeffe's library, and it was published in 1948, and it was illustrated by the artist Miguel Coparubias. And then this is a photograph down here of Claudia O'Keeffe. We can also learn more about O'Keeffe and books through oral histories. So uh, for example, in oral histories, we've learned that O'Keeffe liked and uh, talked about the author Adele Davis here. Uh, she was an author and a nutritionist. And uh, we have learned that O'Keeffe liked to read cookbooks at night and that she liked haiku, which you can see over here. This is a four volume set of haiku books um, from a shelf in her Abiquiu book room. We can also learn more from published books and memoirs. So uh, biographies about O'Keeffe and any of the published correspondence books are great ways to learn more about O'Keeffe and books. And um, these three especially are one, are really great ones to look into. So this one here is the book room, George O'Keeffe's library in Abiquiu. This is an exhibition catalog and it delves into O'Keeffe's book room specifically and highlight some of the really unique publications in that collection. The next one is My Far Away One, Selected Letters of Georgia O'Keeffe and Alfred Stieglitz from 1915 to 1933. So this is the correspondence between O'Keeffe and her husband, Alfred Stieglitz. These letters provide a glimpse into their relationship, the evolution of their art and ideals, and their friendship with a range of key figures in American and European art and culture. And that absolutely includes, you know, different writers and books. And then the third one is Weekends with O'Keeffe by Carol Merrill. Uh, Carol Merrill worked for O'Keeffe in 1973 and O'Keeffe had hired her to catalog her library. So this is a great publication um, from somebody who has experience working in O'Keeffe's library with O'Keeffe. And of course, uh, what we know about O'Keeffe's interest in books come from the collections themselves. We call the books that O'Keeffe owned O'Keeffe's personal libraries. This encompasses the books that she had at her house at Ghost Ranch and her house at Abiquiu. We understand that her books moved between the houses and that she didn't necessarily make a clear cut distinction between the books at this house versus the books at that house. But the books from each of the houses came to be part of the museum's collections in different ways. So we refer to them as different collections. And I'll run through what those distinctions are. So the Ghost Ranch Library consists of publications that were in George O'Keeffe's Ghost Ranch house. This collection is a gift of Anna Marie and Juan Hamilton in 2000. The collection is fully cataloged and fully searchable in the library catalog. There's about 600 titles in total in that collection. And it doesn't reflect O'Keeffe's original organization. So as you can see in this 1967 photograph here from John Lowengard, this is the inside of O'Keeffe's Ghost Ranch house. There's some books along the wall here and then on the bench here. So we know that they were kept around the house. The collection now uh, currently is in the library in Santa Fe. So this is, these are photographs of the shelving in the library in Santa Fe. And next is the Abiquiu Book Room. And this collection consists of publications that were in O'Keeffe's Abiquiu House. Um, this collection was a transfer of assets from the George O'Keeffe Foundation in 2006. We are actively cataloging this collection. Um, as of right now, there's about 2,000 titles that have been cataloged and are searchable in the library catalog. This collection does reflect O'Keeffe's original organization to some degree. Uh, we know that books were kept throughout her house, uh, but they were also primarily kept in this room that she called the book room. And these are uh, contemporary photographs of the book room as it exists today. Um, the way that the book room is organized is kind of essentially by subject. So for example, this corner here is um, our literature books, this section is art books, um, and so on. And throughout the talk today, I'll be pointing out a few of the specific sessions in the book room. 
We know that the book collection was really important to O'Keefe um, because of the efforts that she took to inventory and organize her books. So O'Keefe initially recorded her collection in this telephone address book. And then as you can see, um, it really quickly filled out. Um, she added in then loose slips of paper and then eventually added in an index card system once all of this was full. O'Keefe also employed people to work on her book collection. So she employed people to create lists and to organize the books. You can see in this uh, 1979 National Park Service photograph of O'Keefe's Abiquiu book room, there's kind of these strings going across the shelves. Um, and that's, that was done to indicate that that shelf had been organized and was now complete. O'Keefe also used an embossed stamp on the first page of some of her books. So you can see that's what this photograph is here. Um, so that's on the first page, the top right corner, and it says Georgia O'Keeffe, Abiquiu, New Mexico. From what I've seen in the library, it's fairly inconsistent in terms of uh, which publications get this stamp and which publications don't. There's not a whole lot of, you know, I can't say between this period of time, um, all of these books got this stamp. But it does suggest, you know, um, attempt to track and keep her books organized. So now we'll jump into um, highlights from Oki's personal libraries. So the first book here is uh, The Human Figure, and it is written by J.H. Vanderpool published in Chicago by the Inland Printer Company. And the copy in O'Keeffe's library is the 13th edition published in 1923. Uh, Johannes Vanderpool was an artist and a teacher. He exhibited five works at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. He was a known muralist but he's best known for his teachings on figure drawings. Um, he was so well known and remembered that uh, two years after his death in 1911, the Vanderpool Memorial Art Galleries was established in Chicago. O'Keefe studied with Vanderpool in the fall of 1905 at the Art Institute of Chicago. And this publication, this book, The Human Figure, was initially published in 1907, and it was based on his lectures um, his lectures from the Art Institute, and it is now considered an art school standard. O'Keefe was greatly influenced by Vanderpool, and in 1976, O'Keefe wrote, so this is 71 years after she took his class, she wrote, as he lectured, he made very large drawings on a sheet of tan paper as high as he could reach. He was very clear drawing with black and white crayon as he talked. I always look forward to those lectures. They helped me with the drawings of casts and with the life class. And when the lectures were printed in his book, The Human Figure, I bought the book and treasured it for many years. He was a very kind, generous little man and one of the few real teachers I have known. And you can see, so this is the inside of the book that there are, there is an actual sketch in the pages. Um, and there's a few sketches that were found in the human figure here. So the next book is uh, Faust, a tragedy or a play, um, and it is by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And it, this is the translated by Bayard Taylor edition, published by, uh, in Boston by Houghton Mifflin Company in 1912. So Goethe was a German writer, theater director, critic, among other things, and he's considered one of the great German writers of the modern era. And Faust is likely, is also considered a great literary work. It's a two-part tragic play. This book is unique for several reasons and can tell us a lot about O'Keefe and her early relationship with Stieglitz, as well as the art she was creating during that period. So in 1916, as the correspondence and relationship between O'Keefe and Stieglitz was deepening, Stieglitz sent O'Keefe this copy of Faust. 
Stieglitz had been struggling with his finances and was having difficulty keeping his gallery 291 and the publication camera work going. And Faust was one of Stieglitz's favorite books. He read it often, and usually he read it when he was at the family home in Lake George during the summers. The inscription, which I'll read, um, indicates how O'Keefe's presence in his life was becoming important in the same way that Faust and Lake George had been. So the inscription reads, I have lived. When I was nine, I discovered Faust. It gave me quiet then. I knew not why, but it gave me quiet. And I have lived since then much and hard and in consequence suffered so that I could not suffer anymore. Faust quieted me in such despairing moments, always. And as I grew, it seemed to also grow. It is a friend, like the lake. To one who without knowing has given me much at a time when I needed Faust and Lake, 1916. In addition to the book itself, you can read in the letters between O'Keefe and Stieglitz as they talk about Faust, like in this letter uh, that O'Keefe wrote to Stieglitz in October 26, 1916. She writes to him really excitedly about the book. She says, yes, I, there will be time to read it. When I want to, I make time, and I don't think I've ever wanted to read anything so much before. So there's this kind of back and forth, yes, I'm reading the book, this is what I think about it. Um, and then there's also some really profound moments that they share over this book. So in March 15, 1917, O'Keefe writes to Stieglitz this really beautiful and vivid description of an afternoon spent uh, with Faust by the stream. She says, yesterday afternoon, I came home and got Faust. I'd been wanting to read it for almost a week, but someone or something always kept it from me. And I fled from the house and the phone to get away from them all. I went to a little stream, not much more than 12 feet across. You can't see it till you are right by it. The water is low and has left something. Lime, I suppose, on the ground and grass where it has gone down. That looks just like frost. I don't remember sitting down or lying down, but I was looking at the water almost upside down for a long time before I knew it. Then I sat up and looked at Faust and laughed at myself for carrying it way out there and not reading, just dreaming. And I wondered, did I have it along just because I like to have it by me? So I spread out my handkerchief. I should say one of my handkerchiefs, now that I have pockets, I can carry lots of things, and put Faust on it so it wouldn't get scratched. This letter becomes even more vivid because enclosed in the book were four four-leaf clovers. You can see one in the image in the top right corner. Also enclosed is a handwritten note from Stieglitz that reads, 145, gone to get a cup of coffee, then back next door. So the inscription, the letters, the enclosures paint a really vivid image of the relationship that's developing between Stieglitz and O'Keefe during this time. And in addition to the clovers and the note, there is also enclosed a small sketch. And this sketch shows, so this is the close up of the sketch here, shows a couple of different shapes that O'Keefe was working in, was working with. And these shapes can be really easily connected to other works from this period and at other times. Um, a couple of the examples here is blue number two from the Brooklyn Museum. That's 1916, the watercolor. And then number 17 special, 1919, it's charcoal on paper and is at the O'Keefe Museum. And I'm sure if you are familiar with O'Keefe's work, these shapes probably evoke other works that um, you can imagine. So this book doesn't just tell us just about O'Keefe's relationship with Stieglitz, it also tells us a little bit about the things that she was doing and the work that she was doing at that time. The next book here is Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence, and this edition is the first edition privately printed in 1928 by the uh, private publisher G.M. Orioli. Oh, D.H. Lawrence is a highly influential 20th century writer. He's an English poet, um, and he was known, I think, for a lot of, he faced a lot of censorship, his writings did. Uh, he, his writings explore modernity and industrialization and sexuality. 
he was involved with the Taos Artist and Writer Circle. Um, and so he moved in the same social circles as O'Keefe and Stieglitz, uh, both in New Mexico and also in New York. And Lawrence and his wife, Frida, had property in Taos, and it's called the D.H. Lawrence Ranch. O'Keefe visited the ranch in 1929. And of course, there she painted uh, the Lawrence tree, which is a tree at the D.H. Lawrence Ranch. O'Keefe and Stieglitz were both avid readers of Lawrence's work. Um, O'Keefe's personal libraries contain over 40 titles that Lawrence wrote or contributed to, including the little magazines that you see here, The Phoenix and Laughing Horse. In addition to the you know, 40 plus titles, which take up about four shelves in the book room, there is this picture here, and this is from the book room, um, that shows what we call the D.H. Lawrence box. And it contained a number of pamphlets written by Lawrence, and then it has the uh, title written here, Lawrence, etc., and that's in O'Keefe's hand. Lady Chatterley's Lover is perhaps Lawrence's most well-known book. Uh, Lawrence initially couldn't get this published, and so it was privately printed in Florence, Italy by Giuseppe Orioli. This book was very quickly banned all around the world, including the U.S. Um, in the U.S. and in London, if the book was found, it was confiscated and destroyed. So this copy from O'Keeffe's collection is part of that initial 1000 print run and it's number 389. What makes this book even cooler is that it was sent directly from the publisher uh, to Stieglitz and it even has a note from the publisher inside. So that's what you see here. Um, and on the other side of the note is that uh, Lawrence Phoenix. And it says the other copy will be sent to you with next meal or when I hear from you. Best regards, yours sincerely, GM Orioli. So this is a case where, uh, you know, the book in and of itself is really unique and really um, interesting and special. And this just passed, but I want to call attention to it since we were just talking about a book that had been highly censored. Uh, Banned Books Week ran from September 27th to October 3rd of this year, and it's an annual event celebrating the freedom to read. It spotlights current and historical attempts to censor books in libraries and schools. It brings together the entire book community uh, in shared support of the freedom to seek and to express ideas, even though some consider unorthodox or unpopular. You can learn more about banned books, how to advocate for the freedom to read, and see lists of the top banned books on the American Library Association website. And that's the URL for that is here at ala.org slash advocacy slash books. The next book we'll talk about is Love Days, Susanna Moores. And this was written by uh, Henry Waste and published by uh, in New York by Alfred A. Knopf in 1923. Uh, Henrietta, or uh, as she was called, Eddie Stettheimer, was one of the Stettheimer sisters, as they were known, and that consisted of Carrie, Florine, and Eddie. Their New York apartment was a popular gathering place for artists, writers, and intellectuals of the 20th century. Regular guests at their apartment were people like George O'Keefe, Marcel Duchamp, and Carl Van Vechten. Eddie was a writer, an intellectual, she was highly educated, and she was active in the suffrage movement. Eddie and O'Keefe uh, became close friends and remained close until Eddie's death in 1955. Letters between the two span nearly three decades and reveal a long-lasting friendship. As an example of this friendship, um, in 1927, O'Keefe wrote to Eddie and Florine, and it says, when it is a warm day or a bright day or a gray day, any sort of day, I'm always wondering what it is bringing you. This is just to tell you I'm thinking of you. And one of the things that, were in, that have been enclosed in a book is this little handmade card. So this is a card from Eddie to Georgia, and it was found in the publication Love Among the Haystacks and Other Pieces by D.H. Lawrence, published in 1930. 
so Love Days, uh, written by Henry Waste, which is Eddie's pseudonym. So Henrietta Walter Stetheimer, Henry Waste. Uh, and it follows, the story follows Susanna Moore through 11 episodes involving different relationships in different parts of the world. It's often considered to be a feminist text. In 1923, the New York Times Book Review said about Love Days, in every way, Love Days is a splendid realization of a profound conception. It is not a book for the season only, but a book for many years. In 1929, uh, O'Keefe was out visiting Mabel Dodge Lujan in New Mexico and Mabel Dodge gets sick. And so O'Keefe writes to Stieglitz back home asking him to send out a copy of uh, Love Days for Mabel to read. And this copy in O'Keefe's libraries is inscribed um, from Eddie and it says, to Stieglitz and Georgia O'Keefe, this wrestling of the poplar, Henry Waste, January 1924, New York. And you may notice that O'Keefe's name is misspelled and that is uh, quite common in the inscriptions in the books. The next book here is The Condor and the Cows, a South American travel diary. And this was written by Christopher Isherwood and published by Random House in 1949. Christopher Isherwood, who you can see in this photograph by Carl Van Vechten uh, with O'Keefe at Ghost Ranch, was a writer. His best known works are Goodbye to Berlin, which was published in 1939, and it inspired the musical Cabaret, which came out in 1966, and then later a film by the same name starring Liza Minnelli in 1972. And also the publication Christopher and His Kind, which was published in 1976, and that recounts his experiences as a young gay man from 1929 to 1939 in Berlin. And Isherwood saw this book as his contribution to gay liberation. In 1950, Isherwood came out to New Mexico to visit O'Keefe. And his published diaries recount traveling to Taos with O'Keefe and visiting with people like Dorothy Brett and Mabel Dodge Lujan. Oisher would sent O'Keefe this copy of Condor and the Cows in 1950 after, you know, as a thanks for his time in Abiquiu. The book is inscribed to Georgia and it says, for Georgia from Christopher with grateful memories of Abiquiu, August 1950. O'Keefe traveled to Peru in 1956 and the Condor and the Cows is said to be an inspiration for her travels to Peru. Also enclosed in this book is a card from Miguel and Rose Covarrubias. Take a quick sidestep and talk about an archival item here. This is a New Year's card sent from Rose and Miguel Covarrubias in 1950. Uh, Covarrubias is a Mexican artist, writer, illustrator, anthropologist, and Rose or Rosa was an American artist and dancer. The friendship between Miguel and O'Keefe began in 1929 when both were guests at the home of Mabel Dodge Lujan in Taos um, among a gathering of other modern artists and writers. And then of course, Miguel Covarrubias um, did this caricature of O'Keefe, Our Lady of the Lily. So this is a section in O'Keefe's book room uh, that contains the travel materials. So these are contemporary photographs of the way that the shelves exist today in Abiquiu. This collection of her travel books reflect her interest in adventure and exploration, her lifelong pursuit of learning, and the interconnectedness of her expansive social circle. Because looking at the travel books can help us understand the ways in which her travels informed and reflected her interests and relationships. What I find particularly interesting about this travel section is uh, the sort of travel books next to non-travel books. Um, so for example, this shelf here is mostly about bullfighting um, and they sit next to travel guides on Spain. So you can imagine how if O'Keefe was planning a trip somewhere um, that she may want organized the things that she's interested in about that specific location um, next to the actual travel guides. You can also see on these shelves um, these boxes that we refer to as the travel boxes. 
So these are um, ephemeral material related to her travels that were also kept next to her books. So this travel guide that we'll talk about is the New World Guides to Latin American Republics. And it was edited by Early Parker Hansen, published Duell, Sloan, and Pierce in 1950. This book is very heavily annotated. There are the tabs that you see on the side of the pages, and there are annotations throughout the entire sections on Peru. The annotations that you see in the book, uh, these kind of squiggly lines and underlines, are really um, common in the way that O'Keefe was annotating her books. It's usually a quick underline or a squiggle marking a passage. Also found in this book was the receipt for the book. So it's a three volume set and it was purchased from Gotham Bookmark, Gotham Bookmart uh, on February 11th, 1956. And O'Keefe went to Peru in 1956. And while it's been suggested that Christopher Isherwood's book, The Condor and the Cows, may have had an influence on O'Keefe traveling there, O'Keefe wrote to her friend Anita Pulitzer in 1956 that Spain and Peru I had always particularly wanted to go to. And I suppose one doesn't really know exactly where such ideas come from, though I can trace both to very simple child beginnings. And these next book come from um, an author that she met while she was in Peru. So these are Cuzco, The Window on Peru, written by Miriam Beltran. The one on the left was published by Studio Publications in 1956. And the one on the right was published by Knopf in 1970, and that's the second and revised edition. So while um, O'Keefe was in Peru, she met Miriam Krop Beltran and Pedro Gerardo Beltran Espantoso. Uh, Miriam was an economic analyst, writer, she worked for IBM. She was the first female foreign service officer to serve in Peru. And she married Pedro, who is a prominent Peruvian diplomat and editor and publisher of the newspaper La Prensa. Um, Pedro was actually imprisoned in 1956 for about a month for free speech, um, for free speech in La Prensa. And during the time that he was in prison, Miriam filled in as the publisher. So you can see um, that's Miriam there on the left, and then the photograph of them on the right after Pedro had been released from prison. They were art collectors of Peruvian colonial art, and that collection is actually now held at the Museum of Spanish Colonial Art here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So Keith goes to Peru and she meets Miriam, and from the books and from the letters between the two of them, can see how the friendship continued over the years. So this 1956 edition had a handwritten card from Miriam to O'Keefe. And it says, we may be hard at work on your fireplace when this masterpiece arrives. You'll be happy to know that Jean G opined the other day that nobody was indispensable, rhymes with table. Although that is precisely what I hope this book will be to the Cusco enthusiast. Our best to you and Betty, Miriam. And their friendship continued now for over 20 years. O'Keefe wrote to Miriam in 1963, I've gone around the world three and a half months, then halfway around again, as far as Bangkok and back through Pacific Islands. Twice I've been to Egypt, but I'm going again this spring as both the other times I didn't get far enough. Yet always Peru stands there so vividly as something special. So that's in 1963 that O'Keefe writes to Miriam. And then Miriam sends O'Keefe this book in 1977 and inscribes it for Georgia O'Keefe whose discerning eye has looked through this window and seen beauty denied to us lesser mortals. With admiration and affection, Miriam Crop Beltran, San Francisco, January, 1977. So the final section of books that we'll talk about is, are the cookbooks. So um, on the right there are shelves in O'Keeffe's book room from the cooking section. And then the photograph on the left is from the kitchen in Abiquiu, and you can see that small shelf there also of cookbooks. 
O'Keefe had a really large collection of cookbooks, well over 100 titles. Her taste and interest in quality extended to her preference for foods and cooking. Um, she appreciated ingredients that were natural, that were natural, fresh, grown and prepared with care. Um, she favored recipes that were simple and that supported good health. And um, that's really reflected in the cookbooks that she kept. There, you can also learn more about O'Keefe's, the recipes that O'Keefe was specifically interested in over at the Stories from the O'Keefe uh, webpage. It's the URL for it here down at the bottom. So the cookbook I'll talk about is Cook Right, Live Longer, the Lelord Cordell cookbook by Lelord Cordell and published by Putnam in 1966. And this book is actually, uh, a, I think the only case that I've seen where there is, was specifically one copy for Abiquiu and one copy for Ghost Ranch. So this is the copy that was kept at Abiquiu. And you can see on the inside of the book here, it's written Georgia O'Keeffe Abiquiu House. Lee Lord Cordell was a nutritionist and a writer. He was an advocate for low carb, high protein diet. He was very popular during this during his time, especially in Hollywood. He did face some legal ramifications later on um, for making false claims about some of his products. O'Keefe liked the recipes and she had two copies um, and both of them are really heavily used and very worn. Um, numerous annotations and page markers and enclosures have been found in the copies. So this um, on the top right here are all recipes that were found in the Abiquiu House book, um, just that one book. And this is the copy that was kept at the Ghost Ranch House. And again, you can see really how incredibly worn it is, um, and then the annotations throughout the book. And so these are um, lists of recipes and page numbers. And you can see um, some of it, a lot of it is written in O'Keefe's hand, and then there's also other handwriting there. It looks like a little shopping list found inside. Um, that soup mix from page 110 is noted like four times throughout the book, so she must have been really into that. And that wraps up kind of the highlights of the books. There are plenty of ways for you to learn more if you are interested. You can go to the library's guide to O'Keeffe's personal libraries. And that URL is o'keeffemuseum.libguides.com slash guides slash O'Keeffe dash libraries. But that guide will kind of walk you through the different collections and how you could do some researching there. And of course, you are always welcome to contact the library. So um, our email is library at o'keeffemuseum.org. Thank you. Thank you, Tori. That was an excellent overview of the many, many things I know we have in our, our library. Um, so we have several questions that have come in and please, if you have any questions, place those in the chat and I'll ask Tori. Um, first one, what software do you use for database management of the collections? Well, that is a good question. So for the library collections, we use an open source platform that's called Koha. And uh, Koha is how we manage cataloging the library collections. It also, it's a whole library system. So that's also how we uh, check out books to people, for example. Excellent. And more about Carol Merrill. Was she a librarian prior to cataloging O'Keeffe's um, books? I know she was a grad student at UNM uh, when she went to work for O'Keeffe. I am not entirely sure if she was a librarian. Do you happen to know that, Shannon? I, I don't. I know she went on to be a librarian. Yes. She's a librarian for the Ghost Ranch Library. Mm -hmm. But so I don't know if she was prior to that or not. So it's a great question. <laughs> Perfect question. And what is the most surprising thing you've come across when you've been going through George O'Keefe's books? Uh, hmm. One of the most surprising things, so I can't, there is a book uh, by Beatrice Irwin, 
which I think is called the science of color. And um, I don't, it sticks out to me. There is a small nail file that was found in the book. And I think it sticks out to me mostly because I was surprised by it, but also because um, there, you know, that speaks to the period of time in which you had to actually cut pages open when you were reading a book. And so it really kind of echoes back to a specific period. Um, so there's that. And then there's also in one of the books, we found a really small photograph that is what we think is the only known photograph of Stieglitz photographing O'Keefe. So that was a pretty unique and cool find also. Mm -hmm. Nice. And how would one find the New Year's card from Copa Rubius? Is that available online in our collections? Good question. No, currently it is not. And that is just because that's a collection that we are still um, processing. So the, we are able to help you discover materials that are in that um, George O'Keefe papers, which is where that card is. Uh, mm -hmm. But it would be better to contact the library and we could help you through that process. Excellent. And I saw a couple more questions coming in. Do you know, were there any books um, that O'Keefe read in her library about environmental conservation efforts? Hmm. So I have to say that I am not like a great, I don't have a whole lot of knowledge on that subject as it relates to publications, but there is um, the author Rachel Carson that stands out to me who I think is wrote on that subject. Um, mm -hmm. So good question, but I don't have an answer. Excellent. And there's also a question here about the websites listed in the presentation. Um, I can send those out. I'll be sending an email after the um, talk today with a survey and I will send out all of those wonderful links that Tori shared so you can look into our collections more. And oh, um, does O'Keefe have any picture books or young adult books in her collection? Mm, yes. So there are a number of children's books, um, The Velveteen Rabbit, I believe that there's a Winnie the Pooh, there is um, the, a book by P.L. Travers is in the collection. Yep, there's definitely um, a good range there. There's the book that was written that, that inspired the movie from when I was growing up, Homeward Bound, um, the children's book. Excellent. And what kind of art books are in her library? What artists are in there? What different art movements? There is, so actually that the art section is one that has not been cataloged. So um, I can't speak really to, I haven't worked really directly with that section just yet, but there is, you know, it is quite a range. She was really interested in um, art from Greece and Japan and China. And then, of course, she was collecting books from, you know, the people that she was friends with, mm -hmm. uh, John Marin, Marston Hartley. And so it really does kind of span, but certainly there is an interest in Greece and Japan and China. Nice. And besides um, books, what kind of items would be like in the travel boxes? Yeah, so the travel boxes consisted of um, things like maps. Uh, maybe a guide to translations for common terms that she might need to know, photographs, postcards, notes, um, you know, kind of all of the material that you collect when you're planning for a trip, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. And are there any nonfiction or lighter reading titles in the libraries that have stood out to you? Hmm. Nonfiction, lighter materials. I think all of the sort of nonfiction that stands out to me are pretty, um, you know, are a little bit heavier, like some political science type materials. Uh, but she did collect uh, prevention magazines and National Geographic magazines. She was interested in kind of the Time Life series that covered geography and things like that. And to wrap up, um, when did cataloging her library begin? How long has this process been going on? It has been going on for um, quite a while. So it's, I started working with the collection uh, probably about six years ago. And um, so it is still 
a process that is ongoing. And even um, before my time here, the Ghost Ranch Library had been cataloged. And then um, even before that, there had been additional work to catalog the collection. So this has been an ongoing um, project for a long time. Excellent. Well, thank you, Tori. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And oh, another great question. Yes. How, how many books are there in total? Do we have a total? We don't have it. So as of today, there's about 2,600 titles that have been cataloged. Um, but I would guesstimate that we are going to end up at a, a little over 3,000 once cataloging is finished. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Tori, for this great presentation. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And thank this you. talk will be, it is recorded, and it will be available on our website sometime next week. So thank you. Thank have you. a great day.